Continuing the second season of God's Game of Thrones, we're on episode number three. And we've already looked at King Rehoboam, King Jeroboam, and now we're going to look at King Abijah or Abijam. And he reigned along with Jeroboam. So once again, Jeroboam is going to come up again in this story of King Abijah. Already we've seen Jeroboam in the story of Rehoboam and of course in the story of himself. And now we're going to see Abijah. So here's a brief description of King Abijah. Abijah is Judah's second king who reigns right after Rehoboam, who was the first king of Judah. And Abijah is reigning at the same time that Jeroboam is reigning over Israel. So Abijah, his name means my father is God. Now he's also called Abijam or Abijam. This, this name means my father is the sea. So you see the, the two different names. One name, it sounds pretty good. My father is God. That go, that's his name, Abijah, what it means. In Abijam or Abijam, the name means my father is the sea. And what does this, the sea do? It's like waves. It's, it's wishy-washy. It's, it's, uh, it's up and down. It's tossed to and fro. And the Bible says in Ephesians 4.14 that we henceforth be no more children tossed to and fro and carried about with every wind of doctrine. So that gives you a good um, summary of who Abijah is, his character. He's tossed to and fro. Uh, you'll see him and he seems like he's pretty good, but at the same time he's not a bad, he's, he's a pretty bad guy. So, you'll find Abijah in 1 Kings 15, 1 through 8, and you'll find him in 2 Chronicles 12, 6 through 14, 1. He reigned three years, beginning in the 18th year of the reign of King Jeroboam. So, his spiritual condition, he's wishy-washy. He talks the talk, but he doesn't walk the walk, and he finishes evil. He's from the tribe of Judah. His parents are Rehoboam and Maacah, and both of his parents came from David. That's significant. Rehoboam is the son of Solomon. Solomon is the son of David. Micaiah or Maacah is the daughter of Absalom. Absalom is the son of David. So both parents, both of his parents came from the line of David. Now, Abijah would have had the influence of God because of Solomon being his grandfather. However, his father and mother were both wicked. Rehoboam was wicked, and his mother was an idol worshiper. The prophets for Abijah are Ahijah and Iddo. And Abijah had multiple wives. He multiplied wives, just like Rehoboam did just like David did. He had 14 wives, 22 sons, and 16 daughters. In 2 Chronicles, let's turn to 2 Chronicles. I know you, a lot of people probably don't turn there much, but we're going to look at 2 Chronicles 13, starting in verse 1. Now in the 18th year of King Jeroboam, began Abijah to reign over Judah. He reigned three years in Jerusalem. His mother's name also was Micaiah, the daughter of Uriel of Gibeah, and there was war between Abijah and Jeroboam. So, let's get into this, and to go along with the story of Abijah, as I like to always turn it into a topic as well, we're going to look at things that accompany preaching. And while we look at the story, we're also going to look at things that accompany preaching, because you're going to see what Abijah does is right before this battle, he gets up, he jumps up and starts preaching to Jeroboam and to his army. So look, let's look at things that accompany preaching. The first thing is preparation for battle. And for me and you, this will be a spiritual battle. A spiritual battle goes on. A spiritual battle goes on when you're either preaching or teaching or trying to do something for the Lord. Now, 2 Chronicles 13, 3 through 4. It says, And Abijah set to battle in array with an army of valiant men of war, 
even 400,000 chosen men. Jeroboam also set the battle in array against him with 800,000 chosen men, being mighty, in val mighty men of valor. So he's got twice as many men as Abijah has. And Abijah stood up upon Mount Zemaram, which is in Mount Ephraim, and said, Hear me, thou Jeroboam, and all Israel. Ought ye not to know that the Lord God of Israel gave the kingdom over to Israel, to David forever, even to him and to his sons by a covenant of salt? Now, you're going to notice some half-truths in Abijah's sermon. Because, as you know, from the past studies... God also gave ten tribes over to Jeroboam as well. And Abijah doesn't mention that. But Abijah was prepared enough for battle to have 400,000 chosen men. So they were hand-picked. Uh, these men had to be studied out, looked at, and picked out of other men. They were chosen. Abijah was prepared in that sense. And if you're going to preach or teach, then you need to prepare. And you're not going to be fighting a physical battle like Abijah. You're going to be fighting a spiritual battle. Abijah was prepared in the sense of choosing, studying out men, looking at them. And uh, 2 Timothy 2.15, it says, Study to show thyself approved unto God, a workman that needeth not to be ashamed, rightly dividing the word of truth. There's some preparation that goes into your preaching and teaching. In 1 Peter 3.15, it says, But sanctify the Lord God in your hearts. And be ready always to give an answer to every man that asketh you a reason of the hope that is in you with meekness and fear. Be ready always to give an answer. Study to show thyself approved unto God. Be prepared. Some men wait until it's game day and then claim the Lord is just going to drop the message in their lap. But you need to prepare for battle. Hours are spent. And I mean hours. And just about every single study that I put on here. Hours are spent studying for things that I'm not even doing a study on. I'm trying to build and prepare for spiritual warfare, and that's what you need to be doing as a Christian. How do you do that? When there's things that come up that you can get distracted with, don't do those things. Just stay in the book. It's as simple as that. Just stay in the book, and you're going to get somewhere. You're going to build something. Something that should accompany your preaching, teaching, and the everyday Christian life is preparing for battle. You need to prepare for battle. And the next thing is preaching against evil. In 2 Chronicles 13, 6, it says, Yet Jeroboam, the son of Nebat, the servant of Solomon, the son of David, is risen up and hath rebelled against his Lord. So Abijah gets up and, and rebukes Jeroboam. Abijah is pointing out the rebellion of the king of Israel. And Samuel pointed out the rebellion of King Saul. Remember that he said rebellion is as the sin of witchcraft. Remember that Jeroboam is associated with the number 13, which is the number of rebellion in the scriptures. Uh, a good sermon will expose rebellion. A good sermon, a good teaching. If you're good, you preach and teach at the same time. You preach against evil. You preach against the rebellion that's going on in your day. Second Chronicles 13, 7. And there are gathered unto him vain men, the children of Belial, and have strengthened themselves against Rehoboam the son of Solomon, when Rehoboam was young and tenderhearted and could not withstand them. Abijah exposes Jeroboam, who has gathered children of the devil to work for him and to serve him. And the Bible is clear. That not everyone is a child of God. In Matthew 23, 15, it talks about a child of hell. In Acts 13, 10, it talks about a child of the devil. In 2 Peter 2, 14, it talks about cursed children. In 1 John 3, 12, it says Cain was of that wicked one. In 1 Samuel 2, 12, it says Eli's sons were sons of Belial. In John 8, 44, Jesus tells some men that they are of their father, the devil. In Ephesians 2, 2, Ephesians 5, 6, and Colossians 3, 6, it talks about children of disobedience. Not every person that walks this earth is a child of God, as many people like to believe. We are not all the children of God. Jeroboam and his henchmen were the devil's kids, and Abijah is too, really. He's just, he's wishy-washy. He's going back and forth. But Abijah exposed them for what they were. 
He's obviously not as wicked as Jeroboam. He preached a good sermon, even though Abijah and his daddy Rehoboam were all that much better themselves. They were better than Jeroboam. They were not nowhere near as evil as him. Second Chronicles thirteen eight says, "And now ye think to withstand the kingdom of the Lord in the hands, in the hand of the sons of David, and ye be a great multitude." And there are with you golden calves, which Jeroboam made you for gods. So he exposes Jeroboam. He exposes corrupt government. A good preacher will expose the corrupt and evil things going on in government. He says Jeroboam withstood the kingdom of the Lord. And this is a physical kingdom and not the spiritual kingdom which we fight for today. In the New Testament, Paul talks about men who withstood him. And uh, Abijah talks about how Jeroboam withstood the kingdom of the Lord. But the Apostle Paul says in 2 Timothy 4, 14 and 15, he said, Alexander the coppersmith did me much evil. The Lord reward him according to his works, of whom be thou ware also, for he hath greatly withstood our words. Just like Jeroboam was withstanding the kingdom back then, men are going to withstand you preaching the gospel. So you're going to have to be prepared for battle. You're going to have to preach against evil. There will be men who withstand your words as you preach the gospel and fight for the spiritual kingdom of God. Back then, they were fighting for the physical kingdom of heaven. But Abijah says that Jeroboam has a great multitude, and he certainly does. He's got 800,000 men. Abijah has 400,000. However, never forget, what Jesus Christ said in Matthew seven thirteen and 14, Enter ye in at the straight gate, for wide is the gate, and broad is the way that leadeth to destruction, and many there be which go in thereat, because straight is the gate, and narrow is the way which leadeth unto life, and few there be that find it. There are men, there are more men going the wrong way than there are men going the right way. There's a great multitude going to hell. Something that should accompany your preaching is the preaching against evil. That would include the, the preaching of the false idols of your day. And that's what Abijah is doing right here in, in 2 Chronicles 13, 8. Now you think to withstand the kingdom of the Lord in the hand of the sons of David, and ye be a great multitude. And there are with you golden calves, which Jeroboam made you for gods. Whatever the golden calf is of your day, is what you need to preach against. And there's a bunch of them. It might be a certain type of drug. It might be alcohol. It might be a certain rock group. Find out what the idols are and preach against them. The forces of darkness are trying to withstand you, so you need to withstand them. In Second Chronicles 13, 9, it says, Have ye not cast out the priests of the Lord, the sons of Aaron and the Levites, and have made you priests after the manner of the nations of other lands, so that whosoever cometh to consecrate himself with a young bullock and seven rams, the same may be a priest of them that are no gods. Things that accompany good preaching is exposing the false men of your day. Abijah points out the fact that Jeroboam got rid of the priests of the Lord, the sons of Aaron of the tribe of Levi, and appointed posers in their place. Remember we talked about that last time. He's got priests for dev he's priests for his devils. And that is that is all you have on today on TV. Posers. And in every other church, you got fake religious posers. And second Peter two three it says, And through covetousness shall they with feigned words make merchandise of you. These posers will make a merchandise of the feeble-minded, old people that are homebound and bedridden. They will go after weak people because they are money-hungry cowards trying to make money off the gospel. Something that accompanies a good sermon or a good preacher or a good teacher is the exposing of fake preachers. Don't sh shack up with the fake preachers to save save your face. And... Ephesians 5.11, it says, And have no fellowship with the unfruitful works of darkness, but rather reprove them. Preach against evil. Prepare for battle. Preach against evil. Abijah has been exposing the evil of Jeroboam. Even though Abijah is a hypocrite, 
and he has some half-truths in his sermon. It's been some good preaching. I've heard a lot of good preaching that wasn't 100% doctrinally correct. I've heard some good preaching from a hypocrite that I didn't even like. Now, I'm going to show you something that shouldn't accompany preaching. However, it does many times, and many times bragging and talking about your own accomplishments accompanies preaching, but it shouldn't. Now you're going to see something Abijah has that he shouldn't have in his preaching, and that is pride. You don't want that in your preaching or your teaching or to show up in any part of your Christian life. In Second Chronicles thirteen ten through 11, he says, but as for us... So he's down in Jeroboam. And who couldn't down Jeroboam? Jeroboam is an evil man. But Abijah comes back and says, But as for us, the Lord is our God, and we have not forsaken him. And the priests which minister unto the Lord are the sons of Aaron. And the Levites went up on their business. So he's bragging that he's kept the right men. And it says, And they burn unto the Lord every morning and every evening, burnt sacrifices and sweet incense. The showbread also set they in order upon the pure table, and the candlestick of gold with the lamps thereof to burn every evening. For we keep the charge of the Lord our God, and but ye have forsaken him. Notice that Abijah is bragging about how good him and his people are doing. However, you clearly see in other places that Abijah isn't all that himself. He doesn't even finish good. And he isn't even ever considered to be a good king by anybody. He brags about some things here. His priests burn sacrifices every morning and evening. They set the showbread in order on the pure table. They keep the candlestick burning. They keep charge and don't forsake the Lord. Today, many preachers get up and brag about how much they know about the scriptures. They think they are spiritual because they are always in church. They think they are something with their suit and tie on. They think they really know how to worship better than everybody else. But for every good thing you have going for you, you have about 20 bad things going bad for you at the same time. For every finger you point at somebody, you got about 20 fingers pointing right back at you. Now, it's part of preaching to reprove, rebuke, and exhort. But it's not part of preaching to get up and, and brag on yourself and t- to make yourself look better. Pride should not accompany your preaching. Now, every preacher is going to be imperfect. But he, he, sh- he shouldn't be a hypocrite. He shouldn't be one way while he's preaching and then another way at work. That's hypocritical. And he shouldn't be so... Uh, full of his own self-righteousness that he gets up and brags about it because self-righteousness is a sin. You have to watch your pride. The Bible says in Proverbs sixteen eighteen, Pride goeth before destruction and a haughty spirit before a fall. This, uh, this is why there are qualifications for a pastor. You don't want a pastor that is full of pride. In 1 Timothy 3, 6, it says, Not a novice. Lest being lifted up with pride, he fall into the condemnation of the devil. Abijah preaches a good sermon. He prepared for the battle, somewhat. And many men that are full of pride can preach a good sermon. They have a lot of good ideas. They have a good delivery, delivery. They can do really great things because they're so confident. But it only goes so far. They're full of pride, and it has made their head get big because of maybe all the knowledge that they have, how good of a preacher they are. Something else that accompanies preaching has to do with the people who are listening. So here's something that accompanies preaching in terms of the people in the congregation that are listening. They're picking fights. While you have prepared for battle, you're up there preaching against evil, and you got people that are listening that are Picking a fight. In Second Chronicles thirteen twelve, it says, And behold, God himself is with us for our captain. This is Abijah once again bragging. And his priests with sounding trumpets to cry alarm against you. O children of Israel. He says, O children of Israel. Now listen to this. Fight ye not against the Lord God of your fathers, for ye shall not prosper. 
First, though, uh, notice, Abijah calls God his captain. And Jesus Christ is the captain of our salvation, according to Hebrews 2.10. So, uh, I don't know whether Abijah really feels that in his heart, that the Lord's his captain or not, but he did say it, and that's good preaching there. But notice that statement. He says, fight ye not against the Lord God. There are people every Sunday who fight against what the preacher says after the preacher's prepared for a battle all week while he's up there preaching against evil. You have people in the congregation that are picking fights against what the preacher says, against the Spirit convicting them to get saved or to get right. And the Bible talks about people fighting God. In Acts 5.39 it says, But if it be of God, ye cannot overthrow it, lest happily ye be found even to fight against God. And then in Acts 23.9 it says, Let us not fight against God. Some people say that. And you don't want to fight against the undisputed champion. Revelation 2.16 shows us that he is coming back to fight against them with the sword of his mouth. What you need to do is get on the right side and then fight. In John 18.36, Jesus said, If my kingdom were of this world, then would my servants fight. In 1 Corinthians 9.26, Paul said, So fight I, not as one that beateth the air. The devil is the prince of the power of the air, but swinging at him with your fist isn't going to work. We are in a spiritual fight. And Paul says in 1 Timothy 6.12, he says, fight the good fight of faith. When Paul was making his departure, he said, I have fought a good fight. I have finished my course. I have kept the faith. Abijah didn't finish well. He didn't fight to the death. Hebrews 10.32 talks about enduring a great fight of afflictions. Hebrews 11.34 talks about the Old Testament saints that waxed valiant in fight. Can the same be said about you? It's not said about Abijah. He's talking a pretty big talk here, but he doesn't finish right. And if you're going to fight, then get on the right team. Lest happily you be found to fight against God. And you're not going to prosper, as Abijah said. When there is preaching going on, you have fighting going on in the pews. They're fighting against God when they don't get saved or when they don't get right. If the preacher is really preaching the word, don't fight against what he's saying. But something else that accompanies preaching is plotting against the preacher. In Second Chronicles 13, 13, it says, But Jeroboam caused an ambushment to come about behind them. So you got Abijah's up there preaching, and Jeroboam causes an ambushment to come behind them. So they were before Judah, and the ambushment was behind them. Second Chronicles 13, 13. But Jeroboam caused an ambushment to come about behind them, so they were before Judah, and the ambushment was behind them. So instead of listening to Abijah preach... Jeroboam is cornering the preacher. There have been people spit on the preacher, hit the preacher, throw stuff at him, and do everything but thank him. But Paul said in Galatians 4.16, Am I therefore become your enemy because I tell you the truth? If a preacher gets up and preaches against your evil ways and tells you that you're going to burn in hell, he's trying to save you from a life of ruin and from an eternity of torment. Don't try to ambush the messenger. When you reject what he says, if he's preaching the book, you're simply rejecting God. At the same time, there is something about Abijah. He was preaching a good message, but he shouldn't have been snuck up on. In Ephesians 5, 15 and 16, Paul says, See then that you walk circumspectly, not as fools, but as wise, redeeming the time because the days are evil. Abijah wasn't walking circumspectly. He wasn't checking all sides. In this war, you need to be aware of your surroundings. You don't want to be ignorant of the devil's devices. You need to realize that it's high time to awake out of sleep. You need to have your spidey sense activated on your whole armor of God. You're going to have to pay attention to what the enemy's doing. He got snuck up on. While there are people hating the preacher, at the same time there is something that accompanies preaching that prevails, and that's the prayer of the saints. 
You had people picking fights. You had people plotting against the preacher. But then you had the prayers of the saints going on while the preaching was going on. So something that accompanies good preaching is good praying. Second Chronicles thirteen fourteen. And when Judah looked back, Behold, the battle was before and behind, and they cried unto the Lord, and the priests sounded with the trumpets. There are preachers who have preached some great sermons, but if it wasn't for the prayer of the saints, the message wouldn't have pricked the hearts of the lost sinners and backslid Christians in the congregation. And maybe you can't preach or teach, but you can pray that the words of the man speaking will prick the hearts of the listeners. Prayers are what makes the difference between a victory and a defeat. They lead to the Christian, and this is the next point, prevailing over evil. In Second Chronicles thirteen fifteen, it says, Then the men of Judah gave a shout, and as the men of Judah shouted, it came to pass that God smote Jeroboam and all Israel before Abijah and Judah. Abijah's sermon, mixed with the threat of death, provoked Judah to pray to the Lord, and the Lord heard their cry and smote Jeroboam. And the children of Israel fled before Judah, and God delivered them into their hand. And Abijah and his people slew them with a great slaughter. So there fell down slain of Israel five hundred thousand chosen men. The odds were against Judah two to one. However, since Judah had the Lord on their side, it wouldn't be fair otherwise. In Leviticus 26, 8, it says, Five of you shall chase an hundred, and an hundred of you shall put ten thousand to flight, and your enemies shall fall, you, shall fall before you by the sword. So they were outnumbered, but one anyway, because the Lord was on their side. Verse 18 in Second Chronicles 13, Thus the children of Israel were brought under at that time, and the children of Judah prevailed because they relied upon the Lord God of their fathers. They prevailed with fewer men because they relied on God. And next, they pursued complete victory. Something that should accompany you hearing a life-changing sermon is you may have been living bad before. You may have been just doing middle ways good before but now you as a christian you're pursuing complete victory many times someone gets under conviction and goes to the altar to pray uh, monday rolls around and they're back to how they were on saturday night after you hear a life-changing sermon it isn't life-changing unless you pursue complete victory in Second Chronicles thirteen nineteen, it says, And Abijah pursued after Jeroboam and took cities from him, Bethel with the towns thereof, and Jephsonai with the towns thereof, and Ephron with the towns thereof. Abijah went after Jeroboam and took cities from him. When you pray for victory over sin, you need to immediately pursue every avenue and put barricades up wherever it might creep back in. You need to demolish every spot it has in your life so it doesn't rear its ugly head back up again. You don't want it to recover. And that's why in verse 20, it says, Neither did Jeroboam recover strength again in the days of Abijah, and the Lord struck him and he died. When a great victory happens, you want to give God praise. And what a great victory this was for Abijah and Judah. However, something accompanies good preaching and great victory and that is success. Success can be turned into a bad thing. And that's the last thing we'll talk about is prosperity can kill. In Second Chronicles 13, 21 through 22, it says, But Abijah waxed mighty and married 14 wives and beget 20 and 2 sons and 16 daughters. And the rest of the acts of Abijah and his ways and his sayings are written in the story of the prophet Iddo. So Abijah waxed mighty. He multiplied wives like his daddies did. And if you read about Abijah in 1 Kings, you'll find out that he did not finish well. In 1 Kings 15, 1 through 3, it says, Now in the 18th year of King Jeroboam, the son of Nebat, reigned Abijah. Now Abijah is the same as Abijah over Judah. Three years reigned he in Jerusalem. and His mother's name was Mekah, the daughter of Abishalom. Remember his uh, mother's Mother was the daughter of Absalom, David's uh, son. And he walked in all the sins of his father, which he had done before him. And his heart was not perfect with the Lord his God, as the heart of David his father. Prosperity can kill. And this is one reason why you need to watch out for these prosperity preachers. Fake preachers that say you will have a lot of things and a lot of money if you're living right. 
1 Timothy 6, 5 shows us that gain isn't godliness, but rather godliness with contentment is great gain. Prosperity doesn't have to kill you, but it can. And there are a lot of preachers who started out preaching the right gospel, the right Bible, preaching good and straight, and then they got a little fame, a little money, and then it all went out the door. They chose the money and fame among men over staying faithful. Prosperity can kill. Abijah had a great victory. He preached a good sermon. But prosperity can kill. He let the victory get to his head. He let things get to his head. He let his material wealth get to his head. And the prosperity killed him. It said he walked in all the sins of his father. His heart was not perfect with the Lord his God. As the heart of David his father. And David that would be his grandfather. Great great grandfather. And everybody, every king is compared to David. David is a type of Jesus Christ. You're going to be compared to Jesus Christ at the great white throne judgment if you're not saved. It's not going to be about do your good works outweigh your bad works. It's going to be about do you have the righteousness of the Lord Jesus Christ. And if you don't have it, you're going to be tossed into the lake of fire. There's only one way to get it. And that's to believe on the Lord Jesus Christ. The Bible says in Acts 16, 31, believe on the Lord Jesus Christ. You come to Jesus Christ as a guilty sinner. You realize that Jesus Christ died on the cross for your sins. And you have to accept the payment that he paid on the cross to be saved and to have eternal life. The Bible makes it clear in Romans 10, 13, for whosoever, any of you out there, for whosoever shall call upon the name of the Lord shall be saved. If you want to be saved, come to Jesus Christ right now as a guilty sinner and believe on the Lord Jesus Christ.